Hello and welcome to Chippin, our new series all about home computers. Now you may have been playing around with home computers for some time, or you may, like me, be a novice who knows hardly anything. Whatever, Chippin should be right up your street. For example, we'll meet some of the whiz kids who make up today's new computer generation. Some of our top sportsmen will discover that when it comes to computer games, their brawn may not match a micro's brain. And I'll be out and about finding some improbable uses for home computers. This week, would you believe, I'm off ghost hunting. There'll be lots of competitions too, both for you at home and for families taking part in the studio. But first, what about this splendid Rolls-Royce? It was built at a time when the motor industry was roughly where computers are now. New makes were beginning to appear. Some of them destined to survive, like this one. Others doomed to disappear. Just as many of the less popular micros will disappear over the next decade. Of course, when this car was built, it was a luxury but the cheaper family end of the market was beginning to take off as well, just as the cheap home micro grew out of the more expensive office machines. And there's another similarity. Most drivers know little about what goes on beneath the bonnet of their cars, but they're still good drivers. Chipping won't tell you much about what happens inside a micro, but we will try and tell you how to use it. And to help us, we have expert Jane Bird, who's the editor of Personal Computer World. But first, let's go inside and meet the two families who are going to take part in Chipping Challenge. <laughs> Well, here in the Liverpool studio to take part in Chipping Challenge in which families lock antlers playing computer games are the Singfield family, Jennifer and Alan and their parents, they're from Rainford, and the Kays, Daryl and Mervyn and their parents from Bury. Now we're going to kick off with the first game, which pits Alan Singfield against Daryl Kay. They'll be playing our very own version of the game Xenon Raid. Here you can see the Granada logo man defending Liverpool from space liver birds, which shriek out of the sky above the liver building to wreak havoc and destruction. So it's fingers on joysticks and buttons. May the force be with you both. You've one minute from... <laughs> now, cynics might say that the Space Liver Birds are trying to enter Liverpool in minutes, what the government's been trying to do for years. Here's Alan locked in deadly combat. Does it look like this in the Pentagon, I ask myself? As you can see here, the score comes up at the top of the screen. At the same time, your fuel is rapidly running out. That's at the bottom of the screen. Daryl's face is a mask of concentration. And Barry's answer to Luke Skywalker. Some of the liver birds appear to be dropping things, and it's rather worrying. I think what a pigeon can do. Alan fighting them off with great resolution. Despite that freckly face, he's obviously a ruthless games player. Now we're running out of time. Darrell appears to be in the lead. And that's it. And I can confidently say, looking at the respective scores, that Darrell K is the winner. Well, Darrell K won that round, but I suppose in the end the computer always wins and mere humans don't have a ghost of a chance. And speaking of ghosts, Or what walks here at night? Is the sobbing that's sometimes heard that of an unhappy ghost, a woman in white? If you're looking for ghosts, this old house near Altrincham is a good place to start. Of course, the people who live here are used to hearing creaks and groans. After all, some parts of the house are very old, so the timbers lift and shrink, and the wind gets in and makes eerie noises. But the sound that can't be explained away is the sobbing, the mysterious, muted crying of a woman. Hello. I hope I didn't startle you. Yes, you did a wee bit there, Tony, actually. I was getting carried away. Um, you're a member of the Society for Psychical Research. You've come up here with your computerised box of tricks which detects ghosts and we hope. other phenomena, we hope. Now, what do you make of this place? 
It's interesting, uh, as you said, there are lots of creaks and bumps and, and thumps by the wind, natural causes, but that there is something here, or there could be something here. But we've got to check it out, of course, in detail. Well, a couple of the girls who live here have heard some fairly mysterious things. It's just like noises in the night, and it sounds like a woman wailing and sobbing or crying. And then the last one, it was sounded like singing. And Casey, what have you heard? Same as Tracy, it's somebody crying or somebody singing, and it's at the top of the main staircase or around the attic stairs, and it tends to move towards what's now the back of the house. Can you feel anything unusual in the house as well? It's weird. I mean, it's a very big house, and it, it just feels strange. You know that it's not somebody else, because there's only been us two in the house at a time, so it can't be anyone else in the house. So, Tony, here we are with the black box. Um, now, what are the advantages of testing for the paranormal using electronic methods? Well, using this, you get cast-iron evidence as opposed to the sightings or reports of people. It's, uh, if you like, instrumental proof of what they say they can see. Does that mean that you have to stay up all night with the box as well? No, not necessarily. Once you've started it off, you can leave it and it will record all the different things if things actually occur. It will even record if somebody comes in and tries to interfere with the box. And how long would you leave it to stay in one location? We could leave it all night. <clears throat> we could leave it uh, two or three days if we thought the security was OK. It's programmed, you see, to start off when something actually happens. So can you talk me through the contents of the box? Yes, then? certainly. This is the uh, main body of the computer. You see, just do that and off we start. You've got the program going. We've got two infrared beams set here so that if uh, somebody goes, breaks the beam, it switches the thing on. We've got the sonar here as well. If there's a movement in the room, any slight movement or any slight noise, that will switch the thing on. But uh, if something moves in the building or anybody walks past or touches something, that will set the program going. It will trigger off the light, trigger off the cine camera, trigger off the, the um, still camera and the recorder and anything else that we want to take. OK, well, I'm going to spend the night with the black box in the hope that we can turn something up. And let's find out if we do. There's something there. In most Podergeist cases, you get a flat trajectory, for instance. You don't get something just dropping off. It's more a wail than just somebody crying. Whoa! Don't panic. That was only me mucking about. But at least the black box performed perfectly. I don't think there's anything spooky in there. <laughs> Very odd, that. You wouldn't get me in there again, even if you dangled a carrot in front of my nose. And speaking of carrots, by an amazing coincidence, the next game, which Jennifer Singfield and Mervyn Kay are going to play, is the rabbit and carrot game. Now, in this game, you're in control of a hungry rabbit called Alex. There's a carrot in the maze, and the object of the game is to get to the carrot as quickly as possible. Now, the winner of this game will be whoever gets to the carrot first. So, fingers on keyboards, please. I'm about to blow the whistle. Wait for the off. Now, we can hardly call this a battle of the giants because Jennifer is only seven and Mervyn is only six. Jennifer heading down into the warren, making very good progress. Gradual, oh, she's now turning around and gone the other way. Meanwhile, Mervyn, he seems to be heading in the right direction. He had a momentary... He's bumped into the wall there. Bonk. Oof. And Jennifer, meanwhile, has won. <laughs> well, Jane and I are joined now by Mrs Jan Turner and her daughter Abigail. They're thinking of buying their first computer, and they wrote to chip in for some advice. Now, Abigail, your mum's going to buy you a computer soon. What are you going to do with it? I don't know, because I've never had a computer before. Right, you've never had one, but you're going to buy her one soon. Why? 
Well, apart from games and educational, for homework and for the whole family in general. So you wanted to be sort of fun and an educational yeah. instrument as well. So, Jane, what would you advise? Well, I'd first of all advise you to buy a machine which can really grow with you so that as your skills and requirements increase, so can the computer do more things. So look for lots of expandability, as you can see in these expansion slots on the back of this computer. If you're going to play lots of games, you'll want a really clear, crisp display on screen. So look for good definition that you can see there. And if you're going to use word processing and, and use a keyboard a lot, then you want a good standard size keyboard with nice bouncy keys. If you're buying for the first time, though, is it a good idea to spend a lot of money? It's not necessary to spend a lot of money, actually. So long as you buy a machine which can upgrade and increase, then you can get a good machine for under £200, certainly. And when people buy their first micro, it's often to play games on, isn't it? Now, are there a lot of games available? There are a great number of games around. We've got just a, a tiny proportion from the chip-in studio there, and you can see one on screen. Now, do you think you'd like to play games like that? Yes. You would. Have you played any at all yet? Yes, I've played one. What was that like? <coughs> Mm, there's a butterfly killing weeds and they have to kill the slugs. Oh, well, that sounds fun. Anyway, let's move on. Yes, well, one thing you'll find if you play games a lot is that you might want to start writing games yourself. And if you do that, you'll have to learn a computer language. Now, the most common computer language for home machines is BASIC. And I've got some BASIC on screen here. It says Load Jane. Jane's a little program I've written which tells me what, dis what files I've got on disk. So if I type Return here, I'm going to load my program into the computer's memory. Now, what I want to do is run it so that I can see a complete list of my files on the screen. So, I'll tell it to do it. Oh dear, hasn't worked. The reason it hasn't worked is because it doesn't understand what do it means. That's not part of its vocabulary. The word I have to use is run. There we are. Now I've got a complete list of all my files on screen. Well, we've learnt something there. Now, if you want to buy a computer for educational purposes, which is the best machine to buy? Well, you can use pretty well any computer for education, but it's a good idea to buy a machine that's been around about six months, so you've got lots of programmes for it. And I would recommend that you bought one that has been accepted by schools, such as the BBC computer or the Spectrum you can see just there. And you want lots of software, as I said, like this, and we'll be talking about that in future. We'll leave Jan and Abigail to make up their minds. But you know, it's hard to get impartial advice on microcomputers. If you're a businessman thinking micro, then contact the government-sponsored microsystem centres being set up this month in Liverpool, Manchester and other parts of the country. If you're simply interested in home and family use, try a computer club. Some, like this one, are based in schools, others in libraries or even the upstairs room of a pub. Some clubs use only one make of machine, but many are just gatherings of enthusiasts who bring along their own machines and swap information. To find out more about these clubs, write to us and close a stamped addressed envelope to Chip In Computer Clubs, Granada Television, Derby House, Liverpool L2 3UZ. That's Chip In Computer Clubs, Granada Television, Derby House, Liverpool L2 3UZ. <laughs> Right, now it's back to Chip-In Challenge, and it's the adults' turn. Sid Singfield will be taking on June K, and they're playing a game called Firebird. Firebird is a prehistoric flying monster who seems to have little regard for modern architecture. Here he is, setting another block of flats on fire. You're the fireman battling the towering inferno. You've also got to try and save the occupants by getting them onto your ladder and taking them to the top of the building where they'll be picked up by a helicopter, which also replaces some of the burnt-out flats. Does it make sense? Well, not really. But anyway, you've got one minute from... Now! Now, I find this game pretty hard to understand, but I'll try my best to illuminate what's going on. Now, here's June. Now, she's got to get the occupant of the flat onto the helicopter. There he goes, taking away presumably to hospital. Sid, meanwhile, playing the Paul Newman role, urged on by his family. Has picked somebody up, and there he goes. Now, June, she's doing well, too. Look at the score, boys. I see that she's marginally in the lead. Sid's smiling. I don't think he realises the gravity of the situation. The fireman can also use a hose, but we're not bothering with that because it looks rather rude. Sid takes somebody else away. A relieved occupant of one of the burnt-out flats. We're running out of time. I'm afraid I'm going to have to call a halt to the proceedings any moment now. And there goes the whistle. Good heavens, it's a tie. Mm -hmm. 
Right, that's chip-in challenge for this week. I fed the results of the games into my own computer, which promptly exploded. So in my infinite wisdom, I've decided that the result was a draw. So I'm going to present the prizes now to Jennifer on behalf of the Singfield family and to Mervyn on behalf of the Kay family. Well done. Right, with me now is Matthew Finlayson. He's 11. Recently, Matthew's been testing a light pen made by Stack Computers of Bootle for use with a VIC-20. Now, he's going to tell me what he thinks about it. So, Matthew, first of all, how does the light pen work? Well, the computer throws a dot across the screen to scan what's on it. And so when you touch the light pen on it and t press the button, this computer picks up the light from the light pen and, t and knows where the light pen is. Mm -hmm. So, this can be, this can be in a programme so when you t touch a certain place, something happens. Okay, doc. Now, first of all, what have you been up to with the light pen? Well, I've written a, pre a piano program, which uses um, these notes and the three voices of the Vic Twenty. Okay, just give me, a give me a quick demo. Well, there we go. Like that. And can you compose on that now, then? Well, notes on the Vic Twenty are a bit out because this. So. Yes, it sounds like my singing in the bath there. <laughs> now, what kind of things are you going to do with it next? Well, I thought that you could have a maze on it where you guide a, a man through it using the light pen. Or have a menu at the top full of letters and picking out letters to write a name or a sentence. Mm -hmm. And last but certainly not least, do you think it's good value for money? Yes, I think so. You'd buy one yourself? Yeah. You'll have to save up then, won't you? <laughs> okay, no, thanks very much, Matthew. <laughs> It's competition time now for all you skilled computer people at home. Do you think you could write as good a game as this one? If so, send us your programmes on floppy disk or cassette. Nothing on paper, please, and we'll have a look at it. There are two prizes of £150 worth of computer gear of your choice to be won. The closing date is September the 30th, and the result will be revealed on Granada Reports. And one of the judges will be Jane, who's standing here next to me. Now, what are we going to be looking for? Well, obviously we're looking for originality and really good ideas, but that isn't enough. We're also looking for things which have been really well programmed and have been uh, economical users of the machines that they, they use. So it doesn't matter if your machine hasn't got colour or hasn't got sound. We'll take all that into account. We're, we're looking for something that's been really well executed as well. Now, the category this week is games, but there are other categories too, like a useful programme for the community. What are we looking for there? Well, we're looking for originality again there, but I think we really are looking for something that will be of some use. We've got these machines, we ought to be getting them to work for us, so let's have some really good practical applications. OK, I quite agree. So if you'd like to enter, write to us and we'll send you a copy of the rules and an entry form. The address is Chip in Competition, Granada Television, Derby House, Liverpool L23UZ. That's Chip in Competition, Granada Television, Derby House, Liverpool L23UZ. So that's all from Chip in for today. Now, Jane, what are you going to be up to next week? I'll be asking if computers can be any practical use around the home. I'll be off to Burnley to find out how the ladies' darts league are getting on with their computer. They, believe it or not, are using it to sort out their fixtures. There'll be a competition for educational programmes. And we'll have lots of games, the Chip-In Game, Frogger, Alien Ambush, Families Locked in Mortal Kombat in Chip-In Challenge. But meanwhile, how's your pinball getting on? You mean you haven't heard of my great victory, Mark? I certainly haven't. <laughs>